everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, we continue day two of ACLM week. What is ACLM, you ask? Well, it's the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and all week we will be featuring amazing healthcare professionals from this wonderful organization that you will be learning more about throughout the week. And to introduce today's guest, we have the executive director of ACLM, Susan Benegas. Hello, Chef AJ. Good to be with you today. And uh, so appreciate you dedicating an entire week to featuring some of the just most outstanding champions of the field of lifestyle medicine and the leaders in the field. And uh, for your audience, uh, just a brief uh, moment about ACLM. Uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is the nation's medical professional association for physicians and allied health professionals and uh, those who are really dedicated to a lifestyle medicine first approach to real health care. Because I think many of us recognize that uh, that we so we have a disease and disability care system in this country and our members considered to be the fastest growing medical professional association in the country are on a mission to transform health and redefine healthcare. And when we look at the just rising trajectory of chronic disease, uh, we know that the vast majority of these conditions are lifestyle related chronic diseases. And, uh, and that evidence shows that it's what people are and are not eating to be the leading cause of disease and death. And, uh, and so it's ACLM who represents the medical professionals, the physicians and the allied health professionals who are dedicated to using food as medicine and other lifestyle therapeutic interventions to identify and eradicate the cause of disease as opposed to simply treating symptoms with ever increasing quantities of pills and procedures. So we are excited to be with you and really for everybody in your audience, come to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to find a medical professional who will work with you to eliminate the cause of your disease with the goal of restoring health and not just managing disease. And we're excited to be offering all of um, your Chef AJ viewers and listeners a discount. So in the show notes uh, for today's broadcast are all the details about this, but we're offering a 10% discount uh, during this week of all the shows that uh, offers your, uh, your audience an opportunity to engage in some of our courses, all of which are CME CE accredited. So they're continuing medical education courses, but uh, anyone can engage in our food is medicine course reversing type two diabetes and insulin resistance with lifestyle medicine, our physician and health professional well-being course, as well as our board review course for any medical professionals in your audience who would like to become certified in the field of lifestyle medicine. And uh, so we hope that everyone will take advantage of that. And I'm excited today to introduce the, the guest who you will be interviewing. He is a dear friend, a longtime member of the board of directors of uh, ACLM. He was previously chief medical officer and senior, senior VP of clinical affairs for Food Smart by Zipongo led the national uh, food as medicine strategy through telenutrition to address poor nutrition and food insecurity. Uh, prior to that, he was chief medical director and VP of global benefits and corporate wellness for the Fortune 250 Cummins Corporation out of Indiana. And he was also chief medical director of employee health plans for Vanderbilt University. Uh, and Chief Medical Officer of Healthways is another position that he's held, uh, as well as Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Medical Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. I mean, the resume just goes on and on. He has served on many boards, including uh, HERO, the National Association of Managed Care Physicians, uh, the Population Health Alliance, and most importantly, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, where he's been a longtime board member and the immediate past president of ACLM. 
He's an MD, MPH, MBA, a fellow of ACLM, and a certified diplomat of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine as well, where he just recently stepped off that board. Uh, he now serves as Senior Vice President and CMO of Community Wellbeing uh, and the Blue Zones Institute for Adventist Health serving more than 80 communities on the West Coast and Hawaii. And Blue Zones Institute is definitely a living lab for lifestyle medicine. And he's the foremost champion of the field. And uh, one of my dearest friends, I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Dexter Sherney. Wow, that was quite, I mean, I, I, I mean, that is quite a long list of accomplishments. So nice to meet you, Dr. Sherney. When do you have time to do all this? I, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> Just listening to that makes me tired. But uh, I've, I've had some privilege of being in different places in healthcare for a number of years. And uh, it just continues to get better because the food is medicine. Uh, movement is really catching on. And I think that this is different than any other thing we've seen in, in medicine. And so it's really exciting to be um you know, a part of that, that movement. And Susan, um, as she said, we're, we're longtime friends and companions in terms of this journey that we're doing. And so Susan, thank you so much for all that you've done for the movement. Uh, we could not have done all of this without your leadership. Thank you. So Dr. Sherney, when did you first discover that food is medicine? Well, you know, that's an interesting story. Um, you know, I'm board certified in, in preventive medicine. And uh, I found myself in middle age actually having all of these diseases that uh, were actually preventable. And uh, I had a high cholesterol, even though I was on medication, I was uh, uh, pre-diabetic, I was hypertensive, I was really overweight. And um, I happened to stumble upon lifestyle medicine. I was leading a group of uh, so-called experts in the field for these kinds of diseases. And it was my responsibility to present protocols. And someone asked me one day, they said, well, how come you don't have any lifestyle medicine guys, you know, on your advisory board? Uh, we, had, we had endocrinologists, we had cardiologists, and they were from some of the leading universities in the country. We had no one that represented lifestyle medicine. So I went and I sought out a lifestyle medicine person to be on the committee. And anytime someone new joins the committee, they had to present their data. Well, the, the, the data that they presented was just outstanding. And I decided to make myself an experiment, an N of one. And uh, that's how I got started. Because as you know, when you do that, <laughs> amazing things happen. And that was certainly the, my case as well. How long ago was that? That was about 15 years ago. And uh, I, I'm happy to say that I remain on no medications. I'm not diabetic and uh, hypertension and all those things have gone away. And again, without medications, and that wasn't the case. It was an aha moment for me because, again, I, I'm board certified in preventive medicine. So if anybody, I should understand how to take care of myself. But yet I still had all of these issues that others had. It was because I didn't understand lifestyle medicine. Now I do. Yeah, that, that, it almost doesn't make sense to have preventive medicine without lifestyle, because what would it be? <laughs> well, you know, if you look at how preventive medicine is reimbursed, uh, it's reimbursed basically on early screening and detection. Uh, it's not really about true prevention, other than if you catch something early, maybe you can prevent a more, you know, adverse complication down the road. I got it. Did it, did it change the way you dealt with patients? It did. And uh, most of my work, as you could tell from my resume, really has to do with uh, how healthcare is financed and paid for. I've really spent most of my time on the payer side. And so that's really my lens on the world. And so what I've done is really tried to shape policy and how these things are paid for. And as you know, that still remains a struggle, paying for lifestyle medicine and food is medicine. Yeah, it, because, you know, when you think about it in the long run, they would save so much money. They would, but, you know, that's not how medicine came to it being. I mean, that's not the model. Uh, the model was fee for service, uh, CPT codes, and that's how you get reimbursed. And basically, the more you do, 
uh, the more you make as a provider, whether you're a hospital system, whether you're a pharmaceutical company, or whether you're a physician. And that's not to say that anyone is bad, but there's not the same reimbursement through a fee-for-service model if you actually improve people's health. Uh, think about the physician taking care of a, a type 2 diabetic that might see that patient eight or nine times in a year. Well, if you reverse their disease, you may only see the patient once a year. So where's the in incentive to do that, right? So we really have to get away from these CPT codes. Yeah. Right. But like you say, what, what are, I mean, what are doctors going to do if everybody's well? Well, there are ways to pay people for health. I, that, and that's some of the work that I'm doing right now. As Susan said, I'm the, the president for the Blue Zone Wellbeing Institute, and we're looking and working with a number of payers, uh, employers, as well as health plans to say, how can we pay physicians differently to maintain, to reverse disease and make those the incentives instead of just uh, being on the hamster wheel of uh, reimbursing? Right, because for doctors that want to practice this kind of medicine often don't do it because they don't know how they're going to make a living. Exactly. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. So that's the dilemma. Right. And here we have a comment from a live viewer. Carol says, if you are on Medicare, you do not have the opportunity for lifestyle medicine doctors. Our system is a mess. Well, to her point, that's why we have to change policies, don't we? But it doesn't it take a long time <laughs> to do that? It does, particularly if you try to go through government agencies. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that I have been doing over the past few years is really trying to work with employers uh, because employers, particularly if they're large employers, uh, they're what we call self-funded. They're under ERISA, uh, which is a, is, a, is a structure that allows employers to actually write their own benefit designs and reimburse uh, health care for their employees along the ways that they want, as long as they don't go too far out of bounds. And uh, that gives you much more flexibility. Uh, and, I, and I led health benefits for one of those employers, as Susan mentioned. And so it allows them to do these demonstrations, to try new things uh, to the extent that they want to. And that's a much faster path uh, than trying to deal with uh, some of the government agencies. Yeah, because right now, I mean, imagine if doctors got paid for keeping people well, boy, they, they wouldn't make any money right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the, some of the, the reimbursement that I've uh, uh, structured and actually one of the, the, the pilots that I'm doing right now through the Institute is actually based on paying doctors to keep people well. So as they make people healthier, not just by the procedures that they do, they will actually get paid more. So for example, one of the pilots that we're running, we will pay the doctors a bundled payment uh, for the patients. And then for every milestone they hit, they get actually more money. So if a patient, if they improve the biometrics, that's like their blood pressure and their, their, their weight. Uh, if they reduce the number of medications that the patient needs, and if they reverse the disease, each of those is a step up in terms of their reimbursement. And then if they actually reverse the disease, guess what? Wow. we would actually pay them residual payments into the future for reversing that disease. That gets rid of the problem of not seeing that diabetic nine times a year and only once because you're also getting paid of the work that you've done in prior years that has led to that cost savings and that health improvement. Right. But, you know, when you think about it, the doctor really isn't the one that reverses the disease. The patient has to also be on board, right? Touche, you're absolutely right. Uh, but in this model, the doctor plays a role in that because most patients don't know how to do that and they need help and they need support. And if you think about patients that are on multiple drugs, we have patients that are on as many as 19 medications. You also need to bring in a pharmacist to help the doctor and work with the patient to de-escalate those medications. And so there is a science behind this. And that's why uh, the organization that Susan's associated with and the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine uh, actually certify physicians, board certify physicians in this field uh, because there is a science around it. And you have to be careful how you deescalate medications with these sometimes very fragile patients. 
you know, lifestyle medicine is a, it's 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 fairly new for doctors to be board certified in that. How do we get more doctors to even know that that's an option? Like when when a when a student is in medical school, like when do they see what all their options are? And and do do people know now that that's even an option to get board certified in lifestyle medicine? We've we've been on that, uh, and uh, that's really something that we're working towards that more people understand this. But you know what? I always say you have to follow the money. And if we changed reimbursement, I can guarantee you that you would have a, <laughs> more physicians wanting to practice this way than you would know what to do with. You have to change the reimbursement models. Right now, we're just sort of tweaking at the edges. You know, we're trying to get more reimbursement for group visits and things like that. But again, that's a fee-for-service model. And so it doesn't really, in a lot of ways, promote all the things that we're trying to achieve. It will help some physicians that are trying to do this work now, but it's not the big goal. It's not the long-term goal. And so, um, uh, but you change reimbursement, you will change this. I can't tell you how often a new device that the doctor could deploy in their office, you know, a new echo or or an ultrasound machine comes onto the market and the, the manufacturer says, this is how you can bill for this. And then all the doctors buy that machine so they can use it and, 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 and uh, bill for it. So you change reimbursement, you will change behavior. Well, you know, places like Kaiser, like managed care places, where wouldn't they benefit from this type of model? And they, yes, indeed. And in fact, those are some of the leading organizations that are doing this kind of uh, work and exploring this further. You're absolutely right. Because I think that a lot of times people want to save money. Is I mean, as much as they want to make money. That's right. And, and the way that some of those organizations make money is because they have a risk-based uh, population. And again, they receive payment for that, for keeping that uh, or treating that particular population. And if they can find ways to treat that population for less, they keep uh, the additional money that they didn't have to spend. And so there's the incentive for them to want to do this. And it, it really aligns with a lifestyle medicine approach. And it is the right thing to do for patients and it can be profitable. And so that's the whole point. Yeah. Good point. Right. It, 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 don't we have to change it? Like even before, I think a lot of doctors, when they go to medical school, they're, this is not the type of medicine they're expecting to practice. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's true. You also have uh, doctors that enter medical school, and I think this is where you're headed, but a, a good friend of, of mine, and I'm, I know a good friend of yours is Dr. Gregor. Yeah. Right? And, and, and Dr. Gregor talks about, he went into medical school to do the kinds of things that he saw done with his mother. And it was all about lifestyle. And then when he gets into medical school, he finds out nobody's doing that. No one's talking about that. And uh, it was a great disappointment for him, but he's, he's doing good work nevertheless. Absolutely. What percentage of doctors are lifestyle medicine doctors? Oh, I, I wouldn't hazard a guess, but it's very, it's a very small percentage. Um, yeah, it's, but it's growing. You know, one of the things we're so proud of at the college is that uh, we're now over 7,000 uh, members strong. And those are just the folks that have joined our ranks. That's not to say that uh, there aren't more people practicing lifestyle medicine. Uh, so the, the numbers are growing and uh, we're getting more and more toward a critical mass. The other thing I will tell you about is that we have now over 40 health systems uh, in our hospital system uh, group uh, th that have decided that they want to partner with ACLM and roll some of these things out into their health system. So that's another uh, you know, thing to look at in terms of, you know, um, progress. Do you think that doctors that don't practice some degree of lifestyle medicine, is it because they like the model the way it is and they're threatened, or they just maybe really don't know how powerful nutrition is and lifestyle is for not only preventing disease, but reversing it? I think it's more the latter. I think they really don't know because we weren't taught this in school. Uh, it's none of these folks are bad people. It's just that we weren't taught these things. And so anytime something new and innovative comes along, there's a lot, it's always faced or has to face skepticism. Uh, you know, way back when you might get a, 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 a chuckle out of this, but there was a time when surgeons that used to wash their hands before they operated on patients were actually uh, 
criticized. Dr. Semmelweis, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anything new, even though it was as obvious as, you know, you probably should wash your hands before you operate on a patient, if not wear gloves, uh, you know, lifestyle is sort of that way now is, you know, it, it works. We know it works. The outcomes are far superior, but it just has, is not, ha, has not been the standard uh, for most of us. But, you know, when I think about it, I'm 62 and I remember hearing about Dr. Dean Ornish in my 40s. So at least 40 years. I mean, that that's been a, he's been around a while. Yeah. So that well, it still hasn't made its way into medical school. Medical school usually uh, teaches to the test. Uh, and oftentimes also when you get into residency, you're going to practice uh, according to how you get paid and reimbursed. And so going back to where we started, if you're not getting reimbursed for these things, then you're not going to get a lot of uptake. And also if you haven't been trained. So it's a combination of both. Yeah. So what you're doing then, then is important, trying to change the way things are, are reimbursed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny because I, I, before the pandemic, I always used to volunteer at a hospital once a week doing something called pet therapy. And I've always remarked how the food that is served to the patients in the hospital is some of the worst food. And when I've mentioned that, they say, well, if we don't give them what they want, then we get bad ratings. How can that be changed? That's exactly right. Well, you know, and that's why uh, I love people like you that are chefs because you know how to make healthy food taste good. And I'm a foodie. I love to eat. And uh, I, I just thrive on, on the vegetarian and vegan foods that I eat. And so it's a matter of bringing that kind of expertise into the hospital system where they can serve healthy food and they can still get high ratings. They just don't understand that. Right. And then they... Uh... The, you know, it's interesting is like they have a lot of vending machines and the, the food that they sell, like in the gift shop and, it, you know, in the cafeteria, that's not really healthy either. Yeah, well, you have to realize that that's part of their revenue stream as well, right? I mean, they, whoever that vendor is, whether it's the fast food, you know, burger chain or whatever, uh, they get a piece of that. And uh, if they're not making revenue, then the hospital suffers as well. And so... Um, again, it's about showing people that these healthy foods can actually uh, taste good. It's, it's actually two pieces of it. It's what you serve the patients as well as what you serve the visitors uh, to the hospital wow. and your employees. Yeah, you but there are hospital systems that are working on that. Well, you mentioned you're a foodie and you love to eat. Do you make your own food? I do. Um, yeah, I, I do. I make all sorts of things. Um, and, but you know what? I'm very fortunate that my wife is such a good cook <laughs> and she loves to experiment and do things as well. I used to uh, clip out recipes from the New York times that were not necessarily vegetarian or vegan. And I would give it to her and uh, she could take it like, like maybe the best fish recipe that you might imagine some sort of Cajun fish. And I would give it to her and she would take it and use tofu and seaweed and whatever and turn that into this dish that we got out of the New York Times. And, you know, that's that's really a, a blessing to be able to to have that kind of <laughs> chef right in your own home. <laughs> that's very cool. So you are the past president of ACLM. Did you have to, like, run for president or, or were you running against? How does that work? I did. I had to run and I actually lost the first time around. Oh. Wow, well, good for you. Keep going. I, that's I, how do you campaign for something like that? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a it's a group of like-minded people, and when you've been in the organization for as long as I have, you get to know people. So it's not really an active campaign. And and by the way, the person who beat me is a really good friend of mine, and he deserved it. And um, and then the person who's coming in, who's there now and coming in after, we're all, we're all friends. So it's like one big family. It's a great place to be. What did you do as president? Well, the thing I'm probably most uh, proud of is really um, uh, pushing our, our health disparities initiative. Um, so now we have a group that's, that's called HEAL, uh, Health Equities Achieved Through Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, there are two board members now that are really 
running that for the organization and they're making great progress. It's one of the fastest growing uh, interest member groups within ACLM. And uh, it was in my first state of the college speech and address uh, that I planted the seed for that. And then the members just took it and ran for it. So I can't take credit for all the things that has it has achieved. All I can take uh, credit for is planting that little seed that has now grown into a giant oak. Well, that's nice. How can we get medical students to know more about your work there are member interest groups that involve medical students. We are now giving scholarships through various uh, interest groups that they can attend our meetings and learn more. They can associate with physicians that are practicing lifestyle medicine. So those are some of the ways. We also have members that are actually faculty at medical schools um, that, can also, that are also doing some wonderful things. There are uh, a growing number of medical schools uh, that are now really teaching lifestyle medicine as part of their curriculum. So that's been a sea change over the last few years as well. So we're, we're getting there. I, I know people like us always want to, things to go a lot faster, but uh, we're, 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 we're making progress. Nice. So do you miss being on the patient side of things? There are days that I do miss that, but there are also days that I don't, <laughs> to be yeah. honest with you. <laughs> So, you know, the work that I get to do in policy and reimbursement, you know, I mean, I, I impact large numbers of patients through the things that I uh, am able to achieve. And so that, that to me is very uh, satisfying. And, and even though I may not be the person that directly helps somebody reverse their type two diabetes, I can tell you that at Cummins, people used to stop me in the hall and they would say, Dr. Sherney, it's because of you, thank you that I'm no longer a type two diabetic. And I would have not have known this. Now, I, that wasn't my patient. I didn't sit down across from them and listen to their heart and prescribe. But I put in place the policies and the benefits that allowed other physicians and coaches to work with those patients so that they could achieve those results. And so just hearing those kinds of stories was, was more than enough. That's great. Uh, Linda says, how many doctors have you personally got to go plant-based? Uh, probably well over a dozen. I, I probably have lost count. And some of these were, were physicians that I went to school with in residency, uh, physicians that I used to work with at Blue Cross. And when I went, you know, vegan, they said, what are you doing? And, you know, you have these conversations and, and like me, they gave it a try. And um, some of them just have fantastic stories uh, because they were in a bad health state before before they, they made the change. Others were already pretty healthy and now they've just improved their performance on their marathons and things like that. So it's all good, but uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the world, but it's, it's enough. Does do lifestyle medicine and a plant-based doctor, doctor, uh, plant-based diet always go hand in hand? Cause I've, I've met some doctors who said they were lifestyle medicine doctors or maybe not board certified in it, but then I, you know, I'm surprised when I find out they still eat some animal products. Yeah, it's not it's not a hundred percent, but I would say the majority uh, are plant based, uh, at least predominantly plant based. And you know, one of the questions I um, often ask is, you know, tell me how many folks you've reversed. And the majority of the people that can show you good numbers with reversal are predominantly plant based. Uh, there are some that will try to get there using a you know, high protein, low carbohydrate diet. But when you really understand the science, you realize that the reason the, the, the labs improve, the glucose goes down is because you're just not putting any glucose in the system. It isn't that you have fixed it. So do you wanna live your entire life never eating anything that's a carbohydrate? My goodness, how much good food are you missing, right? If you were to use the other approach where the food actually can heal you, your insulin receptors and those kinds of things. Now you can eat a whole wholesome diet, enjoy your, your diet because you've been cured of this and you can tolerate some carbohydrate and even some sugar in your diet and still not be in a, in a, in a problem situation. So those are some of the ways to distinguish uh, the type of lifestyle that people are doing. Right. Linda wants to know if you have time for exercise and if so, what do you do? I do. Um, I actually live, before we got on the air, we were talking about where I live. 
Uh, I live in Grants Pass, Oregon, which is a rural area. And uh, I'm on 10 acres and it's kind of like my hobby farm and I'm off the grid. And so I cut wood uh, to um, keep warm in the winter time. And uh, I'm out in the garden planting and, and doing those kinds of things uh, during the summer. And so that keeps me pretty busy. And then days when I have to spend hours and hours on Zoom, I have a treadmill that you can't see that's behind this bookcase. And I will put myself on, uh, take my video off. I'll take my uh, iPad and I will listen in while I'm on the treadmill. And I try to do that from time to time during the day because otherwise it's just too much sitting in front of, you know, a monitor. Yeah, I hear you. So you, you, you pulled the Dr. Gregor, huh? You I do pulled that. Dr. Gregory. So funny. I, whenever he's on that treadmill and I have to interview him, I find myself getting a little bit seasick. It is a little. That's why I take myself off of video. Right. Um, Layla says, what do you feel like the timeline will be to switch the insurance agencies to start reimbursing for positive health outcomes? And how close are they to making this happen? I think we're getting closer and closer. I think we'll see it be before the end of the decade. So by 2030, I think we'll be there. There have been some predictions along this line. Deloitte, uh, which is a large uh, uh, you know, consulting house that, that does a lot of uh, looking at benefits and working with employers, they predict that um, we'll see a lot more risk-based care uh, being delivered by 2030. And that's going to flip it. You know, you talked about the Kaiser model. So when more of reimbursement happens like that, then, then we'll get there. Okay. 2030, I'll be, I guess, 70. I'm just trying to get to Medicare. That's just what I, that's just my goal in life is to get to <laughs> Medicare because, you know, I, it's, it's so unfair that somebody like myself and my husband, I'm a 45 year vegan and we're so healthy and we don't really use doctors. And I, I mean, our, our health insurance costs more than our, our mortgage. Every I, know month. It does. I know it does. I know and it's just killing me. It seems like I work just, I mean, just in case of emergency, because I don't want to be without health insurance. That's right. But it's just three more years. Uh, <laughs> three more years. Yay. You never can do been, it. <laughs> never been so excited to have Medicare. Okay. So I just saw a question. Well, this is, this is like more of a medical question, but I bet you can answer it uh, from Joanna. Does eating too much fruit contribute to visceral fat and high triglycerides? That's a good question. Um, it depends on what she means by too much, but if you eat the recommended amounts of uh, fruit, uh, you shouldn't have any trouble. Um, they've done studies where they've actually added fruit to diets that were already high, high carbohydrate. And when you add fruit such as blueberries, it actually blunts the uh, glycemic response. So for most people, it's not an issue. Great. Oh, here's an interesting comment from a live viewer, Susan. I suggested that my doctor look into lifestyle medicine, his response, but then I'd have to walk my talk. How many doctors don't want to change their personal lifestyle? Ah, that's a good question. There's a doctor out of uh, Boston, Dr. Eddie Phillips, maybe you've interviewed him. And that's his life work is to really get doctors to embrace this. And he says that uh, a doctor that hasn't done this uh, for themselves is probably not the person uh, that's going to help you make the change either. I mean, think about it. If you go to a, 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 you're trying to quit smoking and you go to a coach and they're smoking right in front of you, they're not going to get on your case about smoking. <laughs> you, you know, it's so funny. For, I, 40 years ago, when I was 22 years old, I was a respiratory therapist and the head of pulmonary smoked. And I'm like, wow, that's, I, I, I would think that's not the case now, but I, I, it was really hard to, to grasp. Yeah, I went when I was a resident, I went to a cardiology meeting and half the folks were smoking in cardiology. I mean, it's like, you know, really? But uh, yeah, they're not going to be the, the champions. We'll I'll speak, tell you about it, but yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's Maybe. why they say physicians heal thyself. I mean, physicians are people too. Well, and, and you, you may know this, this statistic as well, that some of the, unhealth, the most unhealthy people are, are healthcare providers. Because they probably have a lot of stress, especially now with the pandemic. I can't imagine how stressful it is to be a, yeah. a, any kind of healthcare professional right now. You, you know, um, so we have Mary mentioning that Medicare now reimburses for Ornish programs. So that's kind of a step in the right direction, isn't it? 
It really is. Now, now it took uh, Dean years to get that to happen, but it, it, it is happening now. And you, his program, which is a plant-based diet uh, for cardiac rehab, is being reimbursed. And that's our big win. And we hope we have many more like that. Oh, this, I, this question from Stephanie, it's excellent. Not that the others weren't, but I love this question. Who do you find more interested today in lifestyle medicine? The new young generation or those that are older who start getting lifestyle diseases? Wow, that's, that is a good question. And I don't have any hard facts on that, but just my experience, what I've seen is that it's more the older generation uh, that's interested in lifestyle medicine per se. Now, if you were to flip that question a little bit and talk about plant-based diets, it may then tilt more towards the younger generation, but they're doing it not so much because of health reasons. They're doing it because they, they, they feel they need to because of the planet and, and climate change and things like that. So you said that you have 7,000 physician members now? Yes. So do you have every specialty? Because my understanding is like when you go to medical school, you're, if you want to be board certified in lifestyle medicine, you have to have something else too, right? Like, uh, you know, what anesthesiology or gastroenterology. And I'm curious if, if there are certain specialties, maybe like primary care or internal medicine that are more likely to join your organization, or do you have one in pretty much every type of specialty that a doctor could be dermatology? you know, anesthesiology, are there, is there interest in every type of medicine? There is very broad interest. In fact, our current president is a cardiologist. So while I, I know at the beginning, we were more primary care, internal medicine, family practice, um, we now have a broad swath of medical specialties. There's probably still more primary care docs that are doing it. Um, but yes, a lot of cardiologists, we have rheumatologists and, um, but what we know is that lifestyle medicine is good for every system of the body. So why there, I have a dermatologist, we know what it does to the skin. Oh yeah. Dr. Jessica Krant, who's been on this show many times. She's one yeah. of your members. And, uh, are there any specialties you haven't been able to snag yet? Um, I don't know. surgeon. Um, I don't know what are specialties or medicine. I don't know. And you know, as soon as I say that chef, then that someone's going to call me up and say, I'm part of your group. And that yeah. be that special. I'm, I'm, Cause I'm just curious. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have like emergency room doctors and orthopedics yeah, do. all those specialties. Yeah. 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 Well, do you have a list? Because like, you know, like I would love to, for example, when I, if I was going to see a urologist to just give an example of a specialty, love to see one that's you know, certified in lifestyle medicine. Do you have a comprehensive list for people to find these practitioners? I'm sure we do somewhere. Um, so after the call, I'll, I'll reach back out to Susan if she's not still on and say, hey, can we get that list? Right, because because one of the viewers is saying, how do you find a lifestyle doctor? Ah, that, that that's a good question. And we can also help with that. Okay, that, well, so, you know, just in case, I mean, because people, may not have heard of this concept of lifestyle medicine or the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. What are the pillars of lifestyle medicine? Wow. So the pillars of lifestyle medicine is not going to be a surprise to most people. Uh, it's the things we, we probably grew up thinking we needed to do to be healthy, right? It's, the, it's our nutrition, obviously. It's how we move. It's not necessarily exercise, but it's just our physical activity on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, um, how we deal with uh, stress in our lives, you know, do we have the, the resiliency mechanisms and things like that to, to deal with it? It's how much sleep we get, right? Not too much, not too little. There's a sweet spot uh, that we want to try to achieve every day. Um, it's our social connections, for example. And so those are the things that your lifestyle medicine doctor will prescribe for you. Uh, and it's not just one of them. You know, I, I use this analogy a lot. And so maybe your viewers have heard it of a plant growing in your, in your garden. And we know that if you give the plant the right amount of water, not too much, not too little, you don't want to drown the plant. The right amount of uh, sunlight, not too much, not too little, you don't want to burn the plant. Uh, and the right amount of nutrition in the soil that you get a healthy plant and everything about that plant becomes healthy, the boots, the stem, the leaves, the fruit, whatever, or the vegetables. 
And the human organism is the same way. So when you look at the pillars of lifestyle medicine, it's some of the same things that we mentioned with the plant, right? The nutrition, the water, those kinds of things. But if you do that in the right balance, then you get a healthy orga- healthy human organism. And uh, there's much less other things that you need to attend to, just like with the plant. You don't have to give it as much pesticides and things like that because it actually starts to resist those, pesticide- those uh, pests on its own. Nice. Nice. When is your conference and can anyone attend it? Um, The conference this year will be mid-November. I'm looking at my calendar. That's why my eyes are going up. Uh, My dates that I have here are from the 12th of November through the 16th of November this year. And where will it be? And like I said, can, can, can a lay person join your organization or attend your conference? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Absolutely. We have, we welcome anybody. We have open arms and uh, we have thousands of people, uh, not just our members, but, uh, and not just professionals. And uh, I believe this year it's in, I'll probably get this wrong, but I believe it's in Orlando, but I could be wrong on that. Don't, don't hold me to that. Wow. How many, how many have you had so far? Oh boy. We've had, um, over a dozen, I would say. And they keep growing every year. Um, We had, the last time we did one of these in person before COVID, um, we were about 1800 and we actually had to turn people away. There's so much, there's so many people trying to do it. We didn't have the capacity in the hotel to accommodate these. That's a large scale professional meeting. You That's look at a pretty lot good that. when you've got that many people that want to, I'm assuming that the doctors get continuing education units for yes, attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not just doctors, it's nurses, it's coaches, it's, it's chefs. Um, and so it, it's a, it's a great group. It's a, it's a nice family. Wow. That, that's very cool. And so do you just have all the different doctors that are members uh, as speakers? We invite outsiders as well, but it has to be along the lines of lifestyle medicine for sure. So there are researchers that are doing cutting edge research. Um, There are people that are working within communities, populations, individual patients, uh, people that are seeing uh, individuals. Um, So it it runs the gamut. And we usually have a theme. Uh, Every year we'll have a different theme. So we'll try to focus more on one than something else. Uh, One of the things that we were focusing on uh, a few years ago was, you know, health reform, to your point, how do you really change health and healthcare? And so that was a really well attended uh, meeting. Are they fun conferences? Oh, absolutely. And guess what? The food is fantastic. They serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I, I, I would go just for the food. Wow. And um, they spend a lot of time working with the hotel to make sure that the food is prepared and it's delicious and it's healthy. Um, and most conferences will not give you three meals. <laughs> That's amazing. Do you have any chef demos during this conference? There are those as well. Yes. Oh, wow. I know a really great chef. Oh, I think so. I think I know one too. <laughs> yeah. I got to tell you, I did. I, I can't, I, I'm like my, I'm drawing a blank of the specialty of medicine. The, oh, like. Aaron? No, it's, it's, um, it's doctors that are doctors for workplaces. It's a, it's not a very common name. I wish occupational, it. occupational. Maybe it's, a, it, so I, the, the most fun, and I've done a lot of presentations in my life, virtually and in person, but the most fun I ever had was three years ago at Disneyland. And I did a cooking demo for like, like, I don't know, 300 doctors. And it was, and they, these were doctors from literally all over the world, like every country. Some didn't even speak English, but you know, for cooking, it doesn't matter. Right. And they, they, I think, they, I think they were called occupational doctors. They were like the doctor at Disneyland for the employee. It was a specialty I had never heard of. And it was really a fabulous conference. They had Dr. Rajiv Mosquita and Dr. Steve Rwenda speak. And I came and did a demo and cause there wasn't a lot of plant-based stuff being taught there. And I got to tell you, it was really, really fun. That It was fun work in the crowd. The doctor have great senses of humor. I, I had I had a blast. That does not surprise me. I, I know the the chief medical officer for uh, Disney, uh, Dr. Pam Hamel. I don't know if she's still there, but uh, she was very interested in this kind of thing. So maybe that she, was the one that hired me. But I got to tell yeah, you, yeah, she was, was there three years ago. So yeah, it was a blow. Oh, let me thank.
Nomad for the super chat donation. Thank you so much. There's a question. Do any Canadian doctors attend the conference? Yes, absolutely. We have uh, attendees from all around the world. A couple of years ago, didn't you give an honor to Dr. McDougal? Because I we think did. I remember I was in the video. I didn't come. I, I, maybe it was in Atlanta or somewhere, but I do remember being asked to submit a video and I, I submitted a song actually. We did. Yep. He's, he's been with us uh, from the very beginning. Yes. Well respected, a pioneer in the field. So I would imagine that, I mean, because, you know, there's websites with lists of all the plant-based doctors, plantbaseddocs.org. You got to make sure all those are in your organization. We sure do. <laughs> I, think that's a, that, I think that would be the first place I look. Yeah. Well, you know, and, you know, what you're doing with this show and, and um, the, the, the series of uh, interviews you're doing this week with uh, ACLM, that, that also helps us to reach these physicians that, may not know we exist. Um, and so that, and we can, you know, make the family even larger. So can somebody that's not a doctor take, I know there's a test, like, could I take that test and, and be certified and not in life, not as a doctor, but you know what I'm saying? Like, could I take the test? There are different tests for different disciplines within the professions. And so uh, the physicians take, you know, a test and get a certified as, as being a board certified physician, but they're also, uh, there's a test that others can take and also get recognition for their knowledge as well. I would love to take it. It's probably like a couple thousand dollars, right? Uh, not a couple, but it's over a thousand. Wow. <laughs> At least the one for physicians. Yeah. No, but the one, because if, if, if a person doesn't pass, do they get to take it again or do they have to pay every time? Because I'd be interested. I would, I would just love to take the test to see how much I know, because I feel like just interviewing over a thousand doctors now, I know a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I think you have to pay, pay again, uh, but I could be wrong on that. I should know, but I don't. Fortunately, I, I, I didn't, I didn't fail it to have to take it again. So. <laughs> oh, give me an example of just give me one question from the test. Just one, any single, any one question you remember. Well, you know what, actually behind me, I have, this is the, the textbook that uh, people study from. That's a big book. Does it come on audible? It's heavy. <laughs> it's a heavy book. So it talks about, uh, Basic nutrition assessment includes. I just turned. I just opened it. Uh, anthropoet anthropometric um, data, and it has uh, calculations for BMI and things like that. So you know calipers and and things. So just you know an idea of some of the things. But yeah, it's a big heavy book, and uh, um, but that's what people study from. Is the test multiple choice or is it fill in the blank? It's multiple choice. Oh, there you go. And how many choices? Three? <laughs> it depends on the question. Oh my God. No, I just really, I, I, love te I love studying and I love taking tests. I miss school. Yeah. You know? Maybe I'll yeah. look into that. Linda says she's an affiliate member of ACLM. Absolutely. Congratulations, Linda. Uh, I knew this question would come. I don't know if you've ever seen the show, Dr. Sherney, but it never doesn't come. What do you eat in a day? Oh my goodness. It depends on the day. You know, I'm a, again, like I said, I'm a foodie. I usually start my day with a big cup of blueberries, no matter what I'm eating, I will have some blueberries and I load up on the fruit in the morning. I, I love oatmeal. So I'll load up the oatmeal with, um, blueberries, bananas. Um, I like to add some cinnamon flax seeds, uh, to it, maybe some pomegranates, so, you know, I'm, I'm getting, you know, three or four servings of, of uh, fruit just in the morning um, and uh, with something that's going to hold me like, like oatmeal or quinoa or something like that. Um, sometime I'll do scrambled tofu uh, in the morning. And I like to have uh, whole grain bread with uh, local honey. Uh, so that's sort of my, my sweet tooth. And then it just, it just, it just varies. I eat a lot of, uh, I live in, you know, the West coast and, and, uh, uh, Hispanic food is, is popular here. And so we have a, a great, uh, Cuban restaurant that's vegan. And, uh, so I'll, sometimes once a week I'll go by there and I, I've gotten to know the owner. 
Uh, but at home, I'll also eat a lot of uh, Hispanic food, which is easy. I mean, it's the beans, it's the rice, and there's so many varieties and ways that you can do it. You can grill the vegetables um, on the grill uh, with a little olive oil, and um, it's just delicious. So those are the things that I like. Um my wife is uh, originally from the Philippines, and so she loves fish, and she knows how to cook every kind of tofu fish you can imagine, and it tastes just like the real thing. And so, tofu fish, like like she buys this or makes it? She makes it. She buys wow, tofu. she makes tofu fish. I've never heard it's that tofu fish, and I and I tell you, chef, it tastes just like the real thing. Um, and we do our own uh, mock up of. Uh, um, tartar sauce using vegan ace and and some pickles and things like that and i i tell you it's delicious put a little hot sauce on it and you're good to go we should have her on. <laughs> i've never heard i've never heard of tofu fish that's interesting so yeah. tell us what's the living lab at the blue zones i it's in your resume but i've never heard of it so basically it's it's really testing these ideas that we mentioned so we have a a, a large group of uh advisors we call our think tank susan is is one of those and some other folks and we basically say, what would really make a difference? What do we really need to do uh, in healthcare to make a, a difference and a change? And some of this really uh, trickles down to the communities. I mean, Blue Zones is about communities, but also how do we bring providers into the conversation and the mix? And so a couple of things that uh, have been launched out of that are, are pilots that we're doing along the lines of food as medicine and really looking at how to reimburse for those foods. Uh, one of the ideas that we have has to do with showing the value of, uh, of uh, a plant-based nutrition versus medication. If you're talking about food as medicine, then how do you weave that into the benefit design? Uh, how do you pay for it as a first line therapy instead of always grabbing for the drug, right? Depending on where patients' labs are. Uh, and how do you incorporate that into the formulary? So most uh, health plans have a, a PBM, a, a pharmacy benefits manager that, that, that monitors their formulary, the drugs that are available and the cost of those drugs and which tiers those drugs appear on the formulary that dictates how much you pay for it uh, and how much the plan pays for it. And then there are these step therapies. They want you to go with a generic before you get to a, a, a multi-source brand then before you get to a specialty drug well, imagine now food is medicine, you would actually step through food before you get to the medications uh, if appropriate. And then if that's the case, how do you reimburse for that? And what we're trying to demonstrate is that there's a much bigger value proposition around food. So if you think about it, if you have the diet for, to lower cholesterol, and we know a plant-based diet can do that, not only is it going to lower cholesterol, but it also deals with food insecurity. And a lot of health plans are dealing with food insecurity and hunger. Well, a pill isn't going to fill your stomach and make you feel better. We also know that a whole food plant-based diet helps you with your type two diabetes. Well, the cholesterol pill that you just took isn't going to help you with your type two diabetes. In fact, it might actually exacerbate your type two diabetes causing you to have to take another pill. We also know that it's going to be high in fiber, so therefore it's going to lower your risk for colon cancer. Well, the pill isn't going to do anything for colon cancer. We also know that there's no adverse drug effects, assuming you're not allergic to it. And so therefore, if you look at food all across those things of importance, the value of that is much higher than a single pill, uh, assuming they both treat the disease the same way. And we know that Plants, for example, can treat high cholesterol very effectively for the majority of people. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing. And we use our living lab to test those and reimburse based on the funding we get physicians, incentivize patients along those lines so that we can now prove that this works. And now we can start to change policies. We can take it to the insurers and the other payers and say, look, this is what we did. This is how powerful this is. Do you want to join us? Do you want to do something even bigger? How do we scale this together? Okay, so when can I uh, expect this to be done? <laughs> We're working on it now. <laughs> All right, well, then I'm going to let you go because you need to get back to work and get this done, at least by the time I reach Medicare. Well, everybody's asking if your wife has a cookbook and they really want to see how she makes tofu fish. I got to tell you, know, you that. That's good encouragement. I hope she can hear this because I've been trying to get her to do that. 
I so mean, she would love to, I mean, cause I, I didn't even know it was a thing. So there, there you have it. Well, it's just, you have such a nice speaking voice too. Have you ever thought about doing audible books? I, I have not, um, but thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, I like the, I, I just, I'm, I, I do that. So I, I notice when I hear a, a nice sounding voice, well, thank you so much for the work you do in general and with ACLM and for being plant-based and, uh, and uh, for your time today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Same here. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow as we continue with Lifestyle Medicine Week, where our guest is Dr. George Guthrie. Take care, everyone. And thanks again, Dr. Sherney. Bye-bye.